They asked me to talk about how and when people should engage in new technology, and this is really an interesting uh, topic. And I'm going to start with this because I thought of a lot of ways to talk about this, and one would be to show all the failed technologies and how, you know, MED is a good example. They didn't take off in the U.S., but take, took off in China. And this is a, a picture of uh, a one case with 13 unique complications in it from one surgery. And I, I look at this case every now and then, and I'm not going to say who did it, um, and it reminds me of how complicated things can get, right? So we can always look at a new technology and say, well, that's terrible. You know, I, I don't really, and it's really fun. It's kind of like the, you know, which two pictures, like, where are they different? Like, you can start to pick them all out, though, little complications. Very interesting. But I thought, you know, that's kind of negative, right? Let's talk more about what encourages adoption. And so I think about things like this. I remember I got one of the first Walkman. My parents went to Japan and got me one, and it was a big change over a ghetto blaster. And that's not racist, right? I mean, that's what it was called back then um, for the millennials. They called it a ghetto blaster. That's what it actually was. And so now there was a Walkman, and then, of course, the iPod came next, right? And everybody had to have an iPod. So when we look at spine, wow, what a great field. As a neurosurgeon, like, like Bernhard was saying, you know, brain surgery is not that interesting to me. Look at all the amazing areas where we have were ripe for like massive innovation, motion preservation, MIS fusion, indirect decompression methods, enhanced decompression technology besides laminectomy, smart implants, robots, cobots, we heard about all this, biologics for fusion, biologics for restoration. All these things are so cool, right? And spine is replete with it. And of course, the question becomes, is the technology there and who's gonna use it, right? So this is from Stanford University in 1962, Everett Rogers talking about diffusion innovation. Early, and everybody in this room, I think, is an early adopter, right? So we're sort of talking to ourselves. But then you think about, well, what makes things really get adopted? And we've seen a lot of great slides and talks about that. And I think about something like this. Now, I know we're in Seattle, but in Miami, you know, you got Lyft, you got Uber. I don't know a single person uses Lyft. Does anybody use Lyft? I don't know anybody uses Lyft, right? <laughs> there you go, Rod, right? Thumbs down. Anybody use Uber? Like in the past two days? Yeah, okay. Why is it different? What is the difference here? So there's something called the threshold model for behavioral change. And this is a very complex concept about why some very good things don't get adopted and some really crappy things do, right? So if you think about how humans move and make their decisions, it's like a herd, right? It's like a herd of animals. And there's a herd mentality. And the threshold model has to deal with a population reaching a threshold where something becomes popular. So this is an example of different, and I'm sorry the slides are, it's a little small, but different models depending on whether there is or is not feedback between individuals and who those individuals are. So when I look at someone like Charles Fisher, David Polly, or Roger Hartle, people want to listen to those people. So if they're adopting something, then other people are, are more susceptible to receiving it. If it's some guy using a spine company that only he's the one who uses, right, and we all know that happens, they may have the best thing in the world, but nobody's listening to that person. They're in a little echo chamber, right? So here's another way to look at it, another graph. This is called the FOG behavioral model, and this incorporates things like motivation, right? So on the y-axis, so high and low motivation. So you could argue that one of the things about spine right now, to Rajiv's point, is you can be a really crappy spine surgeon using really inferior technology using the same compensation codes as the guy who's using really cool, sexy technology with better outcomes. There's very little motivation to adopt anything, right? Because finally you learn how to do a laminectomy and pedicle screws. That's good enough, right? But what about on this other side, which is ability? Is it easy to do, hard to do, right? So you can see that all these factors are playing into whether you're going to adopt a new technology. And a lot of forces, right? So I'm going to sort of go through these regulatory considerations, healthcare environment, skill acquisition, right? This adult education concept. So start with regulatory. I'm just going to, just going to be very brief, I promise you. So BMP, OK, so off-label BMP. So I have nothing to do with BMP, but I put this slide up for the last 15 years. Insulin, BMP, genetically engineered insulin, BMP. And people have said to me, Mike Wang, it's not the same, right? Well, actually, you know, it is kind of the same, right? This was the first drug introduced that allowed us to change one of our worst complications, which is a non-union, right? So, you know, we all know about the Yoda study. Everybody's heard. How many people use BMP, by the way, in this room? Yeah, probably like 70% of you guys, right? So you can talk about the safety, the cancer risk, retrograde ejaculation, HO, and probably the most important thing is the cost, right? Because if BMP was cheap, nobody would be arguing about anything, and there would be no litigation because there's no money there. But it was very expensive, so it became a target. But there is not a single person I've met yet. I, maybe I will someday meet a surgeon who says BMP doesn't work. We all know it works. I mean, does it work every time? No, but it, work, it grows bone. 
So the conversation gets shifted by the regulatory environment. So is BMP as we know it today going to be the last osteobiologic on Earth because regulatory killed it off? I would hope not. I would hope it's the first iteration. And we're going to get better and better things. So, so that's very important. I think regulatory controls what we do. So the second is the healthcare environment. So this is, a, you know, I put this together before the election results. This is the ACA, right? This is what Obama promised, right? Greater access, higher quality, lower cost. Is this possible? Well, Business School 101 says, no, you can't do it. More care, less cost, higher quality. So the only hope we have is these two things, new technology and systems approaches. So how can we try to do this as fine surgeons? Because Rajiv gave a really good talk about that. So we could work harder, right? We can do more surgeries for the same price. But that's incremental, right? Are we the big cost center? Is the surgeon's fee like the big cost center? No, no. It isn't, right? We could work for less. Same problem, right? You're, you're, gonna, hit a, you're gonna hit a barrier very quickly. We could improve quality. Well, that implies that we're not trying to improve quality. It's easy to say I want a perfect situation, right? What, is, what was the thing of the metal that you can't have? Unobtainium. unobtainium, right? That's the unobtainium, right? That's insulting. That implies that nobody here cares about quality, right? But technological scientific advancements there. So if you look at something like this is Moore's law of accelerating returns in medicine, if you look at use of inventions, uh, micro machines, per capita US education expenditures, US patents granted, you have this sort of inflection re renaissance point. And this is what it looks like in reality, right? This is US manufacturing output per worker between 72 and 2010. Look at that. Now, this is one of the reasons why the Rust Belt is dying, right? Because the productivity is so high per person that, well, it's human beings in a democracy have to eat, right? So that's a different social problem. But the point is, if we could do 5,000 spine surgeries a year instead of 300, we've increased our productivity, right? So people always say, well, I, I love healthcare, healthcare not economists because they think only inside the little box. They go, but you know, that's more cost. So I like to show this slide, OK? Anybody know what that is on the left? You know, you know what that is, right? You old enough to know? You're not old enough, right? Huh? That, that right. That, well, that was right. That was one of the earliest computers, right? And on the left, that's the early computer. And on the right, that's your current, and we see them right here, your MacBooks, right? The relative cost of these two computers is the same, adjusted for dollars at the time. If you bought, I remember my, my dad brought home an IBM computer in the 1970s, and it was a $5,000 machine. $5,000 back then is like 15, uh, 40,000 maybe today. And the thing wasn't even as powerful as like my watch, right? Like it couldn't do anything, right? And we had punch cards and all, you remember that stuff, right? And the same cost today buys you this thing, right? Okay, so that's important, that's healthcare economics. Now what about so skill acquisition? So this is really, really important because you know, everybody in this room is over the age of 30, right, I think? Anybody under 30? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. How old are you? You're 19? What are you doing here? You're not even a millennial. You're too young to be a millennial. You're Gen Z. That's how we, okay. She's going to start doing surgery at 22. Yeah. So skill acquisition, right? So we have all crafted our arts. Everybody in this room has spent decades honing this art to where we want to be. So uh, Izzy Lieberman's in the back. Mazor Robot. I got a Mazor last year. We had it for a year. It's amazing, right? It overcomes the learning curve for you, right? So Larry Linky said after what, putting in 10,000 pedicle screws, he started to get it, right? Right, David? That's what he says. He started to get it after 10,000. So you, you heard, I won't go into this about the Mazor. You guys know what it does. You're going to see it in the lab. Mazor X is coming out. So it's, it's pretty cool. It does the screws really nicely, right? It's limited, but it does screws pretty well if you know how to use it, right? And so you can use it for MIS. You can use it for deformity. That's a little plug for the reps, OK? So we got the Mazor last December, almost exactly 12 months ago. I'm going to show you a character study. This is a case control study, OK? So this is um, Dr. Sarak. He's our senior res chief resident, he's PGY-7. He's performed over 500 spine surgeries. He's gonna be a spine surgeon, he hates brain. He's from Missouri, he's married with two dogs. He's got IQ 145, okay? He hates the robot. <laughs> Why? He spent seven years learning how to put in these freaking screws and now this machine comes in and it's gonna tell him how to do it. Okay, this is Dr. Basil. He is a uh, first year resident, he's an intern. He performed less than 10 spine surgeries. He worked at BlackRock for three years, very bright guy. He's single, but monogamous. And his IQ is 154, so about the same, right? Same bandwidth, okay? He is the best at the robot of anybody in our department, including myself. 
because he's not biased. We heard that already, right? He, he learned on the robot. So he's the best at the robot. He loves it, right? Think about what that means. Seven years of experience difference, 500 surgeries of learning, right? Lots of complications. So everybody knows about the story of Paul Bunyan and, you know, his babe, his ox babe. And the comp if you haven't seen it, go look at the Disney movie about the train and the chainsaw versus Paul Bunyan, who is the um, giant. Right? Anybody know, not know who Paul Bunyan is? You don't know who Paul Bunyan is. From Minnesota. From Minnesota, right? He's a legend, right? He's a giant who would cut down, when, when the West was Minnesota, cut down like five, 50 trees with one swipe. There's, a, there's poetry about him. And then his ox would take this stuff and drag the lumber to go build the cities in America, in Chicago. And then the chainsaw was invented. And then locomotives were invented. So Paul Bunyan is like David Polly. He's the master of cutting down trees. <laughs> but he couldn't beat the chainsaw, because any idiot could use the chainsaw, right? That's why it's important. So. Flattening the learning curve. So let me just say some things about systems. So I really like Rajiv's talk. And uh, anybody heard of um, ERAS? OK, so this is really good. OK, so, if, okay, so systems-based approaches, which I hate because I really want to hold individuals responsible. I was the one guy who voted that the individual was responsible for the complication, by the way, the 7%. So focus on error, redu error reduction, standardization, team-based approach, iterative improvement, and this buy-in. So if you haven't ever heard of ERAS, please, on your plane ride home, look up ERAS, E-R-A-S, OK? And one of my junior residents approached me about it five years ago and said, you got to look at this, right? ERAS, in just seven years, has taken over all of the other surgical fields except us, OK? And what they do, for, I, I'm sorry about the time, but like basically used to be when you had a colon surgery, right? We're old enough when you were interns, they would keep you MPO, then you'd have your surgery, then after the surgery, you'd listen to the bowels every day, right? When the bowel sounds came, you fed the patient, and they got better, right? Now what they do is they prepare you before the surgery, psychologically, nutritionally. They do the surgery under local or under spinal. Six hours after surgery, they give you that goopy stuff that the marathon runners eat, even though they cut the colon, right? And then they recover like so much faster. It's from Europe, it's from Denmark, right? So um, patient focused, the patient's journey through surgery, team approach, multimodal, surgical fast tracking, and most importantly is the iterative improvement process. They keep tweaking it. They change something, they tweak it, they see what happens, they tweak it again. It's a quality improvement process. So this is something that we need in spine because A, patients are terrified of spine surgery. There's no other operation that every single person comes in and they're terrified of it, right? Recovery from surgery is long and painful. The costs are high. We've heard all this, right? Variability, all these problems that we have, right? So I've been showing this slide for about 15 years now. And this is the track of one patient with pain or disability. And when you do a surgery, guess what, right? You increase their pain. So that area under the curve, that's the cost of the surgery. That's the cost. That's economic, social, psychological, however you want to you know, put it, ATP molecules, morphine equivalents, that's the cost. So what if you could bend that cost, right? So this is what we talk about, like people get shots and shots and shots and they don't get better and they know they're not going to get better, but they're not scared of it because they have no cost in doing it, right? perceived cost. So if we can bend that curve, then we win. So I'll just tell you briefly, because I'm, I'm much more technical than Rajiv Raj. I hate systems. I hate meetings. I couldn't live through meetings talking about stuff. But this is our ERAS spine surgery. And you can see this online. This is the six components, uh, endoscopic, uh, awake anesthesia, percutaneous fixation, using Expiril, which is off-label, expandable inner bodies, and BMP. So three things off-label. But that allows us to do, and this is the first case we ever did, so I always show this video because it reminds me of having an awake T-lift, right? A patient who's basically, this is the former dean of FAU Business School, right? So it's not a dog lab, right? These people are doctors and lawyers and businessmen. And you can see he's basically responsive to us. And we can do a spinal fusion with cages and bilateral pedicle screws and rods. And it looks just like your other surgery on x-ray, right? It's based on technology. Leveraging technology to get someone through a surgical procedure, hopefully to be more like a micro disc or something unlike a spinal fusion. And that's, that's my approach anyways to getting this. Now, in the end, we know that marriage of technology is really key. So here's an example, right? So everybody's heard of the IFLEX, the Baxano IFLEX, like a giggly saw, right? People are afraid to use it. You got to pass it. You got to cost a lot of money. You got to cut out the lamb and do that. What if you were to combine that, like you see on the lower right, with the endoscope? So now you use the endoscope through a stab incision to pass the Baxano catheter, or wire, I should say, and that gets you around the neural frame, and so you know you don't have the root trap. Now you've merged endoscopic with a decompression technology that does not involve a kerosene rangeur or a laminectomy or anything like that. So I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm saying that this is the beginning of thinking about the robot plus the endoscope, not just the robot, right? Image guidance plus something else, right? So think about it differently, and that's where the future is going to be. But Technology is a little dangerous. I'm going to show you kind of a scary slide. And 
look at it for a little bit, okay? This patient came to me, and, and I was a little bit alarmed because there are five, in, five disparate philosophies of spinal surgery, all placed within the same patient by the same surgeon. Okay, so I'll just go through it real quick. A lift, A lift with plate, X lift, inner spinous plate, pedicle screw, T lift, posterior dynamic stabilization, right? These are all conflicting theories of, of what you do to people. Now, you can make an argument for that, but it's, it, it's one of those things I think, like the, our last speaker said, the technology is very valuable, but you got to be aware of its limitations, right? So, thank you. Thank you.